The following is a special presentation of HBO's Sports of the 20th Century. Oakland was always the underdog. We are always the blue collar city. We work hard and they're hardly working. You'll come and play us in our stadium, but you know, Oakland's not good enough for you to stay in. Great town, great people, great crowd. The guys were fighting on the buses, we were fighting on the planes, uh, fighting on the field. Those boys were working their guts out. If it hadn't been free agency, we'd have won every year. They'd hit you harder, they'd hit you later. It's like you might imagine someone's going to put you in with a you know, motorcycle game. In Oakland, they didn't care what you look like, or what you talk like, play like hell. They saw us as rebels because we were always on the edge of something. We were the kind of like the stepchild of the Bay Area, but we won championships. We won championships. Sitting in the morning sun I'll be sitting when the evening comes Watching the ships roll in Then I'll watch them roll away again yeah. There is no sitting there there the was how Gertrude Stein, the writer, described her childhood home, Oakland, California. Oakland was a small city with a large inferiority complex. In the vibrant Bay Area of the 1960s, Oakland was a port town filled with shipyards, factories, and blue-collar workers. Oakland also had the misfortune of being the gritty, low-lying city directly across the bay from San Francisco. San Francisco was Oz. It was the gleaming city uh, to the west. It had beautiful bridges that connected to it. It was truly an international destination. To me, it was, it was Paris, France. It was the most beautiful city in the world. It had TV shows named after it. Oakland um, is the largest container port in the world. <laughs> San Francisco also dominated the Bay Area's sports landscape. San Francisco had the Giants and Willie Mays. Oakland didn't even have a baseball team. San Francisco had the 49ers of the grand old NFL. Oakland's franchise was the Raiders of the ragtag AFL, a team that didn't even have its own stadium. Everything was, you know, like we were second citizens, you know, and, you know, Oakland and the AFL, and it's not Major League. It was Oakland against San Francisco, it was AFL against NFL, and we were just always fighting that, you know, hey, hey, we're here too. We always looked at a second-class citizens over here compared to there. You know, they drank the wine, we drank the beer. Hoping to use sports to help change its second-class image, the city set about the construction of a $30 million state-of-the-art multi-sport stadium. It opened in September of 1966. When you put the Raiders in there and, and the, the Raider fans out of the tough blue-collar city of Oakland, the sort of atmosphere was electric, it was exciting. You look up at the stands, you see you know, black fans, white fans, working-class fans, bricklayers, people who go back into the city of Oakland work all week so they can get a ticket to go to the football game. There was a sort of Hell's Angels feel about them, and they would treat you like that, but it was, uh, they were great in that regard if they didn't scare the hell out of you <laughs> to begin with. You know, there wasn't any special sections. Everybody basically drank out of the same bottle, and, you know, and when they were done, they threw it at somebody. For the Raiders, the Oakland Coliseum was a smash hit, and the city's expensive gamble paid off again in 1968, when Oakland lured the A's from Kansas City. Well, that was probably, at the time, the height of city to have a Major League Baseball team and a uh, Major League Football AFL franchise in your city. So uh, it was an exciting time for the city of Oakland and probably the glory days of Oakland. You have exactly one and one half minutes for this first. By the late 60s, America was looking at Oakland for reasons altogether apart from sports. The free speech movement had erupted next door in Berkeley. The summer of love had blossomed in San Francisco, and anti-war protests were in full swing. 
the Bay Area had become America's hotbed of politics. I don't think I realized at that time maybe just how big a part of what was going on nationally was happening right in my backyard. I didn't like the wall, but the you know, American was in that wall. And I went along because the American was in that wall. And I hated them damn protesters. We would get fights with the police and stuff. They used to, we used to be out in the street going toe to toe with them. And if they won, we got arrested for resisting arrest. And if we won and got away, that was the end of it. A couple of miles from the Hells Angels Clubhouse in Oakland, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale created the revolutionary Black Panther Party in 1966. The two greatest uh, contributions to Oakland in terms of its name identification were the Raiders and the Black Panther Party. With all the Panther power, we will greet you. We will acknowledge you. We greet you only with the revolutionary fervor of the people. We greet you with the gun. As a team, uh, given the explosiveness of Berkeley, the city of Oakland, the Panthers, and all of the things around us, it was very easy for us to be identified with all of those elements. That was just what it was. White people were hippies, and blacks were militant, or Black Panthers. And in the late 60s, you're looking at a political scene that really is starting to become uh, very noticeable. You look at all these things happening, and I think for, for me, it was just a lot coming at me. In 1968, a 22-year-old pitcher from North Carolina named Jim Catfish Hunter pitched the city's first perfect game, a sign that the team's young talent was coming together. A lot of the guys on that ball club, we came up through the minor leagues together. You know, we were basically a family. The A's collection of budding stars included players like Bert Campanaris, Joe Rudy, Gene Tennis, and Vita Blue. Third baseman Sal Bando was the team captain. But everything seemed to swirl around a young slugger from outside Philadelphia, the straw that stirred the A's drink, Reginald Martinez Jackson. He was our power hitter, he was our RBI guy, and uh, you know, if we needed, a, we needed a home run, he was usually the guy that provided it. He loved that red light on the camera, when it popped on, he was at his best. It was the most interesting thing, Joe would hit a two-run home run, I'll make a game-winning catch, and Reggie gets the headlines the next day. Our catfish pitch a two-hit shutout, Reggie gets the headlines, you know, he strikes out three times, he's the headline. In 1971, the Oakland A's won their first division title, but still, they were better known for how they dressed. Baseball teams were only supposed to come in white or gray, and definitely did not look like this. The team colors were Kelly green, Fort Knox gold, wedding gown white, and Vita blue. I had to throw it in there. I think the first year we had solid green bottoms, but no one, we looked like the, you know, large green beans running around out there. There was very little dignity uh, involved in the operation of the A's. It looked like weekend softball players had somehow gotten into major league uniforms. The first time you put them on, your feet look like they're twice as big as they are because you're just not used to seeing white shoes. You know, you thought, I'm not going to buy this white shoe thing, and then they got down there, and that combination of green and gold and white, it's beautiful. The uniforms were the proud creation of one man, the A's owner, Charles Oscar Finley, Charlie O. He looked like the Wizard of Oz, the guy behind the curtain. Raised in Gary, Indiana, Charlie Finley, a steelworker's son, was a self-made millionaire who bought the A's in 1961 and then took Barnum-esque promotions to a new level. He was a gimmick man. He felt that that entertained the fans and the fans needed to be entertained. Like by the enormous mule that he named after himself, Charlie O, who appeared at all A's functions, even the ones that were indoors. He would take the mule right into the lobby of the hotel and have that mule eat oats out of a sterling silver bowl. And Charlie would always tell the hotel people, don't worry, this mule's housebroken. Well, he wasn't. Uh, and in New York, he chose that moment <laughs> to prove it. The thing about the Bay Area is that we're, we're somehow cooler than the rest of the country. And, you know, the donkey and the, the white shoes and the rabbit popping up behind home plate with a bucket of balls, it all seemed really sort of 
Iowa County fair to us. Wait a minute, <laughs> At least the mule kept his job. Finley's humans didn't fare so well. Over the course of 12 seasons, he went through a dozen managers, eight publicity men, seven farm directors, and four general managers, until he finally settled on the one man he wouldn't fire, himself. He was the first to do a lot of things. Because of Charlie Finley, the World Series games are at night. The All-Star game moved to night. The designated hitter, oh, he even tried the designated runner. He was knowledgeable, very knowledgeable. Not to the extent that he could run a ball club on the field, but he could certainly run it from via telephone and, and from the general manager spot and the owner spot. And he lets you know that too. As much of a meddler as Finley was, he was instinctively brilliant at one thing. He had a sense of talent that I've never seen before or since. He could look into your soul and see whether you were a winner. I mean, you might be hitting 310, but he knew that you wouldn't win, that you wouldn't hit 310 when it counted. In the summer of 72, Finley's A's were steamrolling the Western Division. While 60 miles north of Oakland, the Raiders were reporting to camp in Santa Rosa. It was a wild scene every summer when the Raiders came to town, filled with hippies, Hells Angels, and football players looking for a good time. Everybody in town was very, very friendly to us. They were very happy we were there. We had some great bars to go to after practice that made us feel very comfortable, but we all needed to replenish our fluids every day. We had a couple of guys, uh, our two Germans, uh, Jim Otto and uh, Gus Otto, where they were up in the three-pitcher category, which is a gallon and a half of liquid. The team headquartered at a motel called El Rancho Tropicana, which the Raiders turned into the NFL's best frat house, filled with guns, booze, and motorcycles. I remember telling, you know, uh, my wife, God, I don't want to go to training camp. Ah, it's so hard. I couldn't wait to get out the door because it was a ball. Your first experience then with the Oakland Raiders was, it's, it's like you might imagine someone's going to put you in with a you know, motorcycle gang. The guys are big, tough, you know, and, and they don't like rookies very much. I can remember the first time I lined up at tight end, I blocked down on Ben Davidson, and as I always do, I held him a little bit. Ben picked me up, threw me down on my back, and whispered in my ear, I'll kill you if you ever do that again. The Raiders seemed to spring whole from one man's mysterious personality. He was the anti-Finley, dressed in black with a pompadour. He was consumed by the game of football. Al Davis was the NFL's middle finger. He always looked to me to be a Las Vegas car dealer or something, or a casino owner. In Oakland, he had a, he had a black Cadillac Fleetwood brougham with black tinted windows and no license plates. He really doesn't care if you like him. He really doesn't care if you respect him. The only thing he wants you to do is fear him. And Al always kind of carried a chip on his shoulder. About what? Who knows? One day, in uh, preparation for playing the Chargers, he walked by me and whispered under his breath, and they're laughing at you in San Diego. So I said, you can't use child psychology on me. I'm a grown man. And uh, that night, laying in bed, I'm looking up at the ceiling, thinking, are they laughing at me in San Diego? He was sort of that personification of Oakland. He says, OK, fine. You don't, you don't think much of us. You don't like us. Well, we're not only going to prove that we're smarter than you, we'll do anything to prove that we're smarter than you. Davis had been raised in Brooklyn, and his street smarts mixed well with the rebellious new spirit of the 60s. First as head coach, then as managing general partner, Davis built the Raiders into the most intimidating team in sports. They had their black jerseys, they had the pirate logo, the skull and crossbones on their helmet. They'd hit you harder, they'd hit you later, and, and they would wear you down by their sheer mean-spirited persistence. The Raiders were the perfect football team for the people who felt it was an us-against-them situation. It was Al Davis, it was his team, it was the coaches, it was the players against the rest of the world. On, on our itinerary, most teams would say, game, one o'clock kickoff, guess what ours said, go to war. That was about the time that NFL Films and John Facenda and all that stuff had a half hour every weekend. Raiders came out at the second half like men possessed. A Kansas City offense suddenly found itself floundering, 
unable to put together so much as a good combination for a first down. In the meantime, the Raider defense was swarming maniac. You know, that kind of stuff just made it feel wonderful. In 1969, Davis gambled, promoting a young unknown Raider defensive assistant to head coach. His name was John Madden. Madden was essentially nobody. I mean, he was just, you know, this, sort of this, you know, assistant in, you know, size 48 pants. Madden looked like a refugee from the bowling alley, you know. He, uh, shirt tails out, he's sort of stumpy, he's big. He had that kind of like shirt with a tie that was always flowing around. He always wore his credentials, you know, over his tie, so that was flying around. He was always like his shirt was coming untucked, and he was so, he was always like yelling at the, at the thing and pointing. In those days, that was when a lot of guys were, you know, you can't have any facial hair. Uh, you have to wear a white shirt and necktie on a road trip. And those things weren't important to me. I mean, I, I didn't care. Those things had nothing to do with winning or losing. So I only had three rules. They had to be on time. They had to pay attention. And then the third thing was play like hell when I tell you to. Davis and Madden welcomed to Oakland players that other teams thought of as troublemakers. Castoffs, who otherwise had no place in the NFL's polite society. And if you were a Raider, 